The JFK 35 podcast is produced by the JFK Library Foundation and made possible with the help of a generous grant from the Blanche and Irving Laurie Foundation. I'm hopeful that uh, the meeting here will improve uh, the techniques which we all have for preserving the record of the past, but that uh, it will do more than that. It will make it uh, more possible for you and for us to uh, make meaningful this past to our uh, present citizens. President Kennedy said these words to a group of Latin American archivists over 60 years ago in October 1961. As a student of history, he knew of the importance of learning about and from the past. Now, well into the 21st century, archivists at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum continue to work to preserve the record of President Kennedy's past and to make this material in the archives accessible to the public. We'll learn how archivists do that in this episode of JFK 35. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Hello, I'm Jamie Richardson. Welcome to this episode of JFK 35. When John F. Kennedy was president, he was already thinking ahead to building his presidential library in Boston. He expected it to be a place that would give, quote, a good deal of stimulus to the study of American history, end quote. And since the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum opened in 1979, it has done just that. Of the many roles the JFK Library plays, an important one is serving as the place where documents, photographs, audio, film, and other artifacts from his presidency are stored and preserved. And though the Kennedy presidency ended 60 years ago this year, archivists are still busy working with the original materials to make them available to the public. I recently spoke to two of the archivists at the JFK Library, Stacey Chandler and Abby Malangone. All right, so I'm very excited today to have JFK Library archivist Stacey Chandler and Abby Malagone with me today on the podcast. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, welcome back, Stacey. This is your fourth time on the podcast. And Abby, this is your first. So thank you so much for joining us. And to start off, if you both wanted to just let our audience know just a bit about what you both do here in the archives. Well, as you said, I'm sort of a veteran, so I can <laughs> I can go first. I'm a reference archivist mainly, so I answer questions about um, JFK and about our holdings and help people find things in the archives. And I've also been digitizing and cataloging a lot lately too, and working with Jamie a lot on outreach. And I do a little bit of everything. Um, mainly my job is supposed to be processing, so that's the work that gets done uh, so we can open collections for the public to use. After that, I also do reference work, um, like Stacy does, answering questions um, and working the research room. And then I do some digitization and cataloging as well. And what goes into the processing and cataloging for folks who may not know the what goes into that? So processing is for us at the library, we actually have to read through every page of a collection that is not opened yet um, and go through to make sure there's no national security information in there, or mostly we check for privacy um, issues that shouldn't be opened. Um, So it's doing that work, it's organizing it, it's putting it in those folders, giving it a nice title, uh, putting in a box and creating a finding aid. So when you want to come do research, you know exactly where you need to look for things. And so talking about the collections, I think there may be a misconception that the archives are just one massive repository. It's one big collection. So can you kind of talk about what that division is like or how that breaks down? Yes, I could. Um, so basically, we define a collection in terms of how it came to us. Um, so we have a lot of what we would call personal papers collections, which um, is basically think of your own office files that you use for work. They did that in the White House, and we got a set of papers from them, and that would be considered one collection. For example, the Larry O'Brien personal papers. Um, Then we also have collections that consist of government agency work. So the Department of State, the Department of Justice, uh, the United States Peace Corps records, those would be considered a collection. Um, So anything that kind of, it's the way it comes to us is basically how it's defined as a collection and who were the people to work on it and who created it. Right now we have probably just over 450 collections. We get new ones in still, even though the administration's been over for so long, people find things um, or donate them to us even after all this time. So the number does change uh, over the years. 
And, and the volume of the collection or the size of the collection. Um, so we would have a collection that could just be one box. Um, and then we also have the Edward M. Kennedy set of files, which is about 8,000 <laughs> boxes. Um, so it really varies. Wow. So I've also been following along on your blog that the arch- archivists write, and it's been interesting to see what kind of things has been going online since, especially since the pandemic. Can you explain a little bit about what has been going into the digital archives that folks can access? Yeah, when we first kind of closed the research room and closed the archives in March 2020, we still were working um, remotely. And one of the things we were able to do was start looking at our digitization backlog, which is kind of just a fancy way of saying the things that have been scanned that haven't been put online yet. There are a lot of reasons that can happen, but the main one is just that it's faster for us to scan than it is for us to describe what we have scanned because we're adding all sorts of things. You know, we're describing the entire folder, but we're also adding subject terms so that people can find things more easily. We're adding like what we call technical metadata, which is information about how it was scanned, when it was scanned. So those things take a really long time, and we tend to have a lot more that's scanned than that we've cataloged and put online. But suddenly we didn't, you know, we weren't running the research room anymore, doing on-site processing work like what Abby does. So we had time to really address this cataloging backlog and put a lot of those materials online. So what you're seeing is things that we've scanned, as we call it, systematically, which is we decided a collection is so high use or has some other sort of interest or value that we've decided to scan it top to bottom, starting from box one all the way to the end. And then others are, they've been scanned because researchers have asked us to. So we have a program where people can ask us to scan something on demand for them. And instead of photocopying, we would prefer to do that because we can scan it once and never have to touch it again, unlike photocopies. So our goal was really to push out as much of that to make it public and free for people to access as we could uh, while we were closed. And can you talk for a second, you mentioned digitization on demand. So I think another misconception about the research room or visiting to do research is that it's only for fancy scholars. So can you please dispel this myth for us here? It is not just for fancy (laughs) scholars. Um, We want everyone to come and do research. It is a public place and you are more than welcome. Do not be afraid. But digitization on demand is a great program um, just because sometimes it costs a lot to get here. If you're flying in, you have the cost of a plane ticket, you have hotel costs, you have food costs, where if you just know you need to look at a couple folders, we can scan those for you and it makes the process a little more equitable for everybody. I know I benefited this fall from that, so thank you both for scanning some of JFK's press secretary's press briefings for me. And then, so are there any specific collections or stories you've come across as you've been cataloging that have been of kind of of interest to you or have been significant in some way? Uh, So I did a lot of um, digitization on demand work uh, whilst we weren't open to the public, um, but we were still accepting orders. And oddly enough, one of the most requested collections we had for digitization was uh, the Joseph P. Kennedy personal papers collection, so JFK's father. Um, So people requested 92 folders um, of his to be digitized, which was kind of a lot (laughs) compared to what else other requests we got. And I am basically like everyone's dad in that I really like World War II history. (laughs) And (laughs) the person who requested a lot of these folders was very much interested in Joseph P. Kennedy's service as an ambassador to Great Britain. Um, So getting to kind of scan and then read through and catalog his diaries from that time period was kind of cool just because a lot of times we tend to kind of segment history into different parts and okay this is happening here this is happening here this is happening here Um, but it just goes to show how related everything is Um, my favorite things were when he was writing in his diary about going to have a meal at Buckingham Palace and it would be a young Queen Elizabeth um, and Princess Margaret sitting there and he would relay conversations he had with them so just kind of combining those things together uh, was kind of cool for me to see and you Stacey One of my favorite collections to work on was the Pedro San Juan personal papers, which was one of the first ones we did. We realized that over the years we had cataloged or we had digitized so much of it for researcher requests. We only had a few folders left to go. So Abby scanned those and we cataloged them and put them online. Pedro San Juan was a really interesting guy. He was, he worked for the protocol department at the uh, United States Department of State. And protocols are really interesting place to work because they are 
sort of advising the president then the U.S. government on how to receive visitors who come from places all over the world, you know, everything down to like, here's what they might like or will not eat at a state luncheon, here's if you can serve them alcohol or not, and all the way over to things like making sure they have sort of a dignified stay, they can get access to services and accommodations that are appropriate for them. And Pedro San Juan said, you know, he, we have an oral history from him, and he started out saying that he really did not enjoy this job. He found it very boring. But he kind of stumbled across this news story where African diplomats were running into a lot of racism when they visited the United States, Asian diplomats as well, where hotels would refuse to give them a place to stay, or they would go to a restaurant and they would be turned away because it was a segregated restaurant. Um, you know, they're visiting the D.C. area and the corridor the corridor between uh, Washington, D.C. and New York. So they were running into a lot of issues in that area of the country. And he really was trying to address those both to, sort, you know, obviously to improve the United States reputation around the world for the way that they were receiving these visitors. But he was also very interested in civil rights domestically. And his collection is a really good reflection on the work he was doing. It was really interesting to catalog and do more research on him to be able to describe those materials. So that was one of my favorites. We've also done some kind of more fun ones. We published Lem Billings' personal papers, which is a small collection of letters that JFK wrote to him in the 1930s. And those were fun to read and catalog as well. Can you remind us who Lem Billings is for folks who may not remember? Yes, uh, Lem Billings is one of our favorites here at the library to talk about. He was uh, JFK's best friend. They met at boarding school, their boarding school chote, when they were teenagers, and they remained friends for the rest of JFK's life. And can you explain a little bit what the letters are like from JFK to Lem? Yeah, so JFK is writing these letters between 1934 and 1939 and Lem donated the whole collection to us. It's only JFK's letters to Lem, but they're really interesting. You know, this is all stuff that you would expect him to be writing when he's like a teenage boy up into his early 20s. And they're kind of gossipy. They uh, give you a lot of updates on like what's going on with JFK's health because he's staying in like different medical facilities at this time. He was having issues with his back and his stomach already that we see kind of ongoing for the rest of his life. So they're really great to get a sense of their relationship and JFK in that period of his life. We don't have a lot of material from that time from him, from his voice specifically. So it's a really useful collection for that. Awesome. Thank you. I'll just jump in quick on that. Uh, that was when I started working here. That was the first collection I processed. <laughs> and so working on, I was like, this is unbelievable. I'm sitting here reading the thoughts of JFK when he was 15. Um, and then being like, Can I, am I allowed to open this? It seemed so kind of personal, but also just kind of what a teenage kid would say. So it makes it very relatable. And would have been a good crash course in reading his handwriting, I would imagine. Yes, that it was, was good. It was, it was much better then. <laughs> it got, I think as he got busier, it got a little little harder to read. Um, and then there, are, so it's, we are in March now. It is Women's History Month. I just wanted to touch on briefly another collection, the President's Commission on the Status of Women, which I think you've recently also cataloged and put online. Can you also get in a little bit about what that organization was and what might be in those, in that collection? Yeah, this is one I'm working on it right now. I think about five boxes are finished out of the collection. It's not that large. It's maybe 12 or 13 boxes. This is the U.S. President's Commission on the Status of Women Records, which is a mouthful. This commission was sort of founded by JFK, but it was actually proposed by the director of the U.S. Labor Department's Women's Division. Her name was Esther Peterson. She's really cool, really interesting person. Um, It was her idea. She developed it. Other staff at the Labor Department, and then it was chaired by Eleanor Roosevelt. And it had a lot of sort of luminaries of the 1960s in it on the commission. And they were really doing work to address inequality that women were facing as they were trying to get more into the labor force and also trying to exercise their civil and political rights. You know, they had had the right to vote only for a few decades at this point. And you know, there were state laws that still prohibited women from serving on juries, for example, or from working more hours in a week than, you know, men in the same job would be able to work. So things that were really limiting their opportunities. 
And this commission was looking at those laws and making recommendations to the president on addressing them, repairing some of them to give women a a better chance to be fully participating in society. Awesome. And then one other thing I know you've, the archivists have spent a lot of time thinking about is how the content of the collections reflects the time and the time obviously for a lot of people was not amazing. So can you kind of get into the, what you call the reparative work or that you've been doing? Yeah, there's uh, in the archival field, there's sort of a sub field or a subset of work that's reparative description and reparative digitization. Um, this is a really important effort to try to describe communities and people in a way that reflects how they would describe themselves and how people see themselves reflected in the historical record and whether or not they're represented in the materials that we bring into the archives, but also what we choose to process, what we choose to digitize and put online, how thoroughly we describe that versus how much we describe something that's like just about JFK. So reparative description is really about trying to even a lot of that out and make sure that we're really reflecting the breadth of not just what was going on in the United States in the 1950s and 60s, but what is in our holdings, because we really do have a lot of this material that's representing, you know, many groups, many communities of people. So we've been digitizing some of our collections that we find really interesting that maybe researchers aren't requesting as much for many reasons, one of them just being that a lot of times they're not as thoroughly described as some of the White House collections. So some of those are ones we've already done. We've done the Herbert Tucker Papers, which is a small collection mostly pertaining to the 1958 Senate campaign of JFK's and then his 1960 presidential campaign, where Tucker was the assistant director of the Civil Rights Division. So he's focusing on black voter outreach and the work that that Civil Rights Division did to really help secure these victories has been sort of unsung over the years. So digitizing that material, making it freely available, we're hoping that more people will use it and and study the work of the division. So finding, finding, I kind of use in quotes because I think that's kind of a, I don't know, an easy word to use, but it's not entirely accurate. Um, But coming across these stories and these documents, what is it like when to find something that may have been, you know, in this folder for many years without a person entirely knowing where it was or recognizing the importance of it? Well, I think one of the things we contend with um, kind of in archives is you want to have people's stories told, but you also know at the time that they were writing the letters we had or the diaries we had or something like that, they were writing that not knowing that we would all be reading <laughs> their thoughts. And so I think that's a, a struggle a little bit that we contend with. Um, but it's also kind of cool <laughs> um, at the same time. Going back to those Joseph P. Kennedy personal papers, People also requested that a lot of the family correspondence be digitized, so digitized that and cataloged it. And there's some really poignant things in there. Joseph P. Kennedy Jr., five days before he died, maybe wrote a letter to his parents telling him them not to worry because the mission he was going on wasn't dangerous. And reading these things, knowing what we know and knowing what's going to happen, it just puts a, a different slant on it, which they would never have thought of at the time. He, he didn't write that knowing he was going to be killed. So it's things like like that, which we really have to contend with sometimes. But at a certain point, I think we're always just trying to balance um, kind of a need for privacy with something that really tells a story. Um, so obviously, the Kennedy family is extremely well known, and a lot of a lot is known about their life. But sometimes, bringing out something like in the work Stacy's doing with reparative descriptions, um, even though these individuals might not have known that it was going to be out there for public access and public consumption, um, it really helps to get a story told. So we're happy to do that. Yeah, for me, especially with the reparative description and digitization work, a lot of this, when I go to scan the material or even just to survey it to choose it as the next collection I want to work on, a lot of times I've never heard of the people who come up in these collections or the work that they were doing. So it's really gratifying to do the work, but sometimes it, I can be like, how do people not know who this is? And, you know, how do people not, how are people not aware of the kind of work that was going on? You know, People at the very top of an administration tend to get credit for things that happen in the administration, but there are so many wheels turning outside of just that the Oval Office. And 
doing some of these other collections, working on them, seeing how, you know, grassroots activism is feeding up into some of these committees. These commission members are, you know, coming from groups all around the country, community groups and grassroots activist groups. It just makes you see how these kinds of policies that people get credit for at the top of an administration really are born with, you know, the citizens and in the American public and with these people who are really passionate about serving their communities. So seeing that and, you know, it makes me want to like help make these people famous. You know, (laughs) I really want their work to get out there. I want people to know who they were and, and how important they are in the history of the country, even though their name isn't on, isn't on the legislation, for example. Or even just to acknowledge that even though they worked closely in the cause of Kennedy campaigns or something like that, or closely with other members of the family, the work that they were doing individually is also really important. It's not just in their connection with a Kennedy family member. Uh, One of our collections, the Gene Stein Personal Papers collection, is basically kind of just a group of interview transcripts and some other associated material with the book that was being written about Robert F. Kennedy after his death and his funeral train and the work he did in terms of civil rights and Vietnam and um, poverty in, in Mississippi and in the South. But the people that were interviewed for this project include people like Bayard Rustin and Marion Wright Edelman. And so even in their t- talking of their stories and their relations with Robert F. Kennedy and the work they did with him, they really talk a lot about their own work kind of as a byproduct of that interview. Um, So they're really great to read too because you're getting to learn more about these individuals and the important work that they did themselves outside of of the Kennedy realm. I feel like it makes the history much more textured and accessible. Like it's not just JFK did this all and it's impossible for any of us to do anything. It makes it seem a little more like, okay, maybe I can do something. So we will definitely be sharing all of the links to all of the letters and collections we've mentioned today on the podcast. And also listeners can follow along on the archives blog, which we will also include. Is there anything else coming up that you're excited about that you're working on or will be publishing on the blog perhaps? Yeah, so one of the things that we do here is... uh... We call it a staff picks. We're kind of, as you could tell from us talking, we kind of find letters or documents here or there that we really like, that we speak that speak to us, that we think are poignant, or whether we just think they're really funny. Um, so every so often we pick a different topic. And so right now we have a staff pick exhibit up on letters to the president from children. And these are some of my favorite letters in all of the land. And so we have those lists um, on our blog right now. There's a blog post about that. But then it's also, you can see it visually if you want to come to the museum. Um, in the museum lobby, there's a little display of those. Um, My staff pick was from a girl who wrote to JFK because she thought with Cold War tensions, a good way to ease that was with music. So it's very creative. The drawings are super funny. Uh, So we love stuff like that. Um, So we really get to highlight things that we see that don't necessarily have another place for them to be broadcast. So we like to give them their due too. Basically, you're seeing what archivists take pictures of on our phones and text to each other while we're doing our work. That's what ends up in the staff picks. And I think you did text me that one. That's Abby. exactly how I was like, I know I have something good in here somewhere. Just keep flipping through my phone. Awesome. So yeah, I encourage folks to come if they can, if not visit it online. And I want to thank you both for taking time to talk to us today. As always, delightful conversation to hear what you're doing. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining us today. The letters and collections mentioned in the episode today are available on our podcast page, jfklibrary.org slash jfk35. If you have questions or story ideas, email us at jfk35pod at jfklfoundation.org or tweet at us at jfklibrary using the hashtag jfk35. If you liked what you heard today, please consider subscribing to our podcast or leaving us a review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. Thank you.